so you guys can see my eyes. So as he said, he said, my name's Paul Franks, and if you guys don't mind, I'd like to pray before we get this going. <clears throat> Good morning, Papa. Good morning, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this, this immense blessing that you have blessed me with this morning, Lord, to speak in front of my brothers today. I thank you, Lord, as I look out on all these faces and I see the vast wisdom that you have placed in every single one of them. I thank you for the testimonies that you have brought them through, Lord. I thank you for all of the insight that you have given them, Lord, and the fellowship that they take the time to have with one another to get to know you better, Lord. I ask, Lord, that the words be spoken out of my mouth be yours and not my own. May I decrease so that you may increase, Lord, in all things and in all ways. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. So, my testimony is kind of a, I guess you'd call it a far out one. I started hearing the voice of God's voice from a very early age. When I was first born, my mom was the youth director at the Salvation Army in Oakland. Squirrel. And which I don't know who knows about Oakland, but it's kind of a rough neighborhood. And so we lived in the apartment above the church. And starting at a very young age, I started having these imaginary friends, or at least at the time I thought they were an imagine it was an imaginary friend. <laughs> and they used to sit there and tell and tell me these stories all the time. But the thing was, is I was deaf until I was four years old. So there's no way that I could have heard a normal person speaking to me. So after that, my parents seemed to have gone, uh, went down two very different career paths in life, and they wound up getting divorced. My mom decided to go into law enforcement, and my dad decided to go into bank robbery. <laughs> a little bit different of a dis distinction there. <clears throat> and so I went, I went with my dad, and it, at the time it probably wasn't the best custody choice, but I love my dad. I love, I love my dad. Um, and he tried. Very flawed man, but he tried. He did take the time, even though the stuff that he was doing wrong, he still took the time to take me to church. He took, uh, he took the time to try and teach me the characteristics of a good man. He sat there and tried to tell me, don't, don't steal, even though he was robbing a bank. Tell me to be honest, even though when you look at it, the life that he was living was a lie. And he told me to do all these good and righteous things, but the thing is, is that he wasn't doing them himself. The loudest that we can ever speak to somebody is not in what we say. It's in what we do. In the book of James, it says, you show me your faith with your words, I'll show you my faith by what I do. Another one was by St. Francis of Assisi, which I've always absolutely loved. He said, go throughout the world, preach the good news, and if you have to, talk. I want someone to see that I love them more than hear it any day of the week. That's another place in which he faltered, is even though he saw I, I, that he told me all this stuff, the physical violence still increased and increased after my parents' divorce. 
Um, there was quite a few times that I got lumped up by my father. And it put this perspective on what it meant to be a dad that wasn't true. Wasn't true. The, ideal, and the idea that a dad is supposed to be big and tough and hard at all times and I'm a macho man. It, granted, those things, are, and the, those things are what they are. But to be able to lean down and give your son a hug and be vulnerable and be able to look at them and tell them sincerely, I love you. To be tough enough to be able to shed a tear in front of them. That's being a tough guy. So, at about the age of 12 years old, my dad wound up going to prison. Um, and sometimes I never really contemplated the severity of the cultural shock <laughs> that came with going from my dad to moving in with the law enforcement officer. <laughs> it, it was different. It was very different. My, and see, my mom wound up divorcing my dad when she went and she started at juvenile hall as a, as a juvenile hall counselor. And the thing is, is that over time, she went from being that the person who worked for the church, working with the youth and working for God and raising God, helping to raise the children of the neighborhood in a godly fashion to learning how to raise delinquents, to learning how to raise people who didn't know how to behave. And, and don't, don't get me wrong, in any way, shape, or form, my mom in my eyes is a saint. Best, per, uh, best person I know. At the time, she had a real temper, though. And that a lot came from the environment she was working in, I believe. Um, and me having a lot of my dad's traits, what you, I'm sure you can guess what I heard quite a bit. You're just like your father. You're just, you're just like your father. But then later on, I got, I'm hearing how much she hates my dad. She's never once told me she hates me, and she never would. My mom loves me. I'm her baby. But it still correlated in my head hearing her say, I hate this man, and then hearing you're so much like him. And you know what? In a lot of ways, I'm like both of them. I took on their traits. And it's a, te it's a learning lesson now. Because even, even, a, even a bad example is still an example. It's what way we use it that really matters. Do we use it for, for going down the same road and going whoop right off the edge like they did? Or do we use it to learn? My grandfather used to always say that a smart man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Never claimed to be wise a day in my life. <laughs> so after my dad went to prison, I start up. I was uncontrollable. I mean, for a while, um, for a while, it's like I still had the appearance of a good kid and the, and the good kid and all of that. But then over time, next thing you know, I'm at 13. I'm into hard drugs. Um, I started sticking a needle at my arm in my arm at the age of 13 years old. 
and it was with a young lady that was a bit older than I was. She was, she was about, I think, 24 or 25. And at the time, I didn't see it for the abuse that it was. For the abuse that it was. I had that false male ego, that stupidity that some guys have, especially I had, of thinking, oh, hey, it was cool. You know, I mean, that was, some, that was consensual. It was something I wanted. That's not something that I wanted. But it's something that happened. And again, what do I use it for? I use it to edify and to learn from it. Now I do, at least. So by 15, I was doing time myself. The first time I ever got incarcerated was at 15 years old, and I remember my step-parent came in and they came in and opened up, because they worked at juvenile hall as well, they came up and opened up the door and just looked at me and said, I am so disappointed in you. And it crushed me. Because I was closer with them than I think I was with anybody except my grandpa at the time. So I'm sitting in a cell all, all alone, or at least I thought that. I thought that I was alone, but I wasn't. I wasn't. God is so good that he will see us in our darkest times. In our darkest moments, he will see us. When we are in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. So, from 15 to 18, I was most of the time incarcerated. They let me out for a couple months and I'd be right back in. And at 18 years old, the judge did something I never thought would happen. He said, you know what? I'm kicking you off of probation. You are incorrigible, and I will wind up seeing you later on. At the time, I had no idea what incorrigible meant, so I was like, thank you, that is so sweet. I thought it was one of the nicest things I ever heard. I thought that I had the ability to encourage people and do all of that. You know, and I was like, I'm incorrigible, Mom. She was just looking at me like, you idiot. <laughs> and, but what he was saying, because I'm going to see, he was basically telling me, I'm going to see you in the adult system. And sure enough, sure enough, I saw him in the adult system. Starting at, eight, starting at 18 years old, I was already in county. Um, by 20 years old, I was on my way upstate. I had already caught my first number. And I'll tell you, driving into San Quentin State Prison at 20 years old, driving through those steel doors, whew, you want to talk about a gut check. Sitting there being chained up to some older gentleman that's got tattoos all over his face. And it's just a real eye-opener of to where my life was headed. And j just to rewind a second, I, uh, when I was in jail that time, before I went up, a young lady who I had been best friends with since young age, basically professed her love to me. And we, be, we both started picking up the Bible I, because I picked up the Bible for the first time in there when I was in county as an adult. And she picked up the Bible at the fir, uh, for her first time too. And here's the thing that was so astonishing about it. 
When I opened up the Bible, I knew what was in there already. I knew that I read I read the scriptures and I remember I remembered what they were. But I remembered what they were not from the stuff my dad told me. I wasn't really paying attention then. I remember what they were from what the voices told me when I was a kid. Before I could hear. Before I could hear the rest of the world in my ears. Now, one thing I should have put the disclaimer on before I even stood up here to start to talk is if you don't believe in miracles, you're not going to like this story. If you don't believe that God, our Heavenly Father, is the same God that He was back then to where He could raise the dead, you won't believe half of the stuff i got to say right now. So, I open up the Bible and the pages just bleed out to me. And so, this young lady basically tells me that, you know, I love you. And I've been in love with you. And I never asked her out because she sat there and uh, it always told me, oh, my best friends always ask me out and it ruins it. But I told her no, because at the time, I thought that, that I was saying no because I was headed off into prison. But God put it on my heart to say no because I know He had me on a, on a different path. And it was going to be a hard path, because I was so hard-headed. I didn't want to listen to anybody. And he knew the amount of suffering that I would not only put myself through, but I would put my family through. I'd put my loved ones through. So I'm going through my prison terms, and I don't know how much any of you know about prison, but... While I was in prison, I was very heavily involved in politics in there. But when I went to my cell, <laughs> this is how good God is, ready to work, Father. Every single celly I had was generally a lifer and generally so faithful so much of a man of God that I would consider them more monk than convict. They not only had verses of the Bible memorized, they had full chapters memorized, man. They would sit there and be able to just, oh, you're going through this? Well, the Bible says this, 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 or just recite chapters of it. I had one brother that had pretty much the entire book of Philemon memorized. And... So when I went into the cell, that was holy ground. We didn't talk about anything that was going on in the prison. Drugs did not enter our cell. Cigarettes did not enter our cell. We took our shoes off when we came into it. Because that was the place that God was going to be filling us. So that we could go out into the darkness. And I wish I could tell you that, oh, I went into the darkness properly and I fought the good fight, but I failed on so many counts. I sat there and still wanted to be that guy. I still wanted to have those keys. I still wanted to lead the path of destruction and chaos that the enemy wanted me to lead. So... Fast forwarding a little bit, I go through my prison terms, and on my last one, they had a thing called the AB 109 Early Release Program. And they, so what they do is they leave you in county for half of your time, and I could go into all that, but the important part is I met two gentlemen. 
on that last term when I was in county. One was a friend of mine, a brother of Christ named Don Dickey, who would go in every Thursday and preach. He got me going to church on the outside to a little church in San Jose called New Life Christian Covenant. The second was a man named uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Dickerson. And he, did, anyway, he would go into the jails and he would teach what's called biblical 12 steps. And when he came in, and, and when the homework assignment he gave us, it was to, to write down verses in the Bible and, ones, one of, and the ones in Hebrew, because I had a strong exhaustive concordance with me, the ones in Hebrew I wrote down in, or the ones in the Old Testament I wrote down in Hebrew, the ones, the questions of the New Testament I wrote down in Greek, because I had the Strong's in front of me. And he saw that and he looked at it and he was like, this is right. That man wound up paying for my college education in seminary. And don't get me wrong, I didn't follow that track even then. Even then I was sitting there and though I was done breaking the law, I was still hanging out with people I shouldn't. I was still running amok. I was still winding up in situations where, where friends were losing their lives. I, had, I was with a friend in, in Reno that got shot and killed because of stupid stuff. He, was, he had the wrong thing on his vest and he died because of it. At his funeral, another friend of mine, at the funeral of a, of a brother who got shot and killed, gets shot and killed right there at the funeral. Pointless, pointless chaos. Two men taken away from their families over what? Over what? Because one other group didn't like this group? So, not sure how... Uh, ten, minutes. 10 minutes. So let, now, <laughs> now I'm going to get to the fun part. So, August 5th, 2020... I contracted botulism. I had a massive heart attack and I died for 30 minutes. Well, excuse me. They don't know how long I was on the ground before they found me, but it took 30 minutes for them to resuscitate me. Because I had went to the hospital, got all hooked up, and then I tried to leave. And they found me in another part of the hospital dead. Took them 30 minutes of working on me to get my ticker going again. When I came to, I was completely paralyzed. I couldn't even move my head. And the first thing I remember is them cutting into my throat. Because they thought I was in a coma. See, because I couldn't move anything. So they thought I was in a coma. And so when they think you're in a coma, they don't do things like numb you or put you under. And so I was conscious for those things, the things like spinal taps, the things like a feeding tube. And I remember crying out to God, and he heard me. And he heard me. Because of the botulism, I couldn't open my eyes. Couldn't see what was going on around me. I was in a paralytic position. I couldn't move. I couldn't even breathe on my own. And it took three weeks for them to even realize I wasn't in a coma. Because I started to be able to move my foot. So they realized, oh, this guy's conscious right now. So they were able to start asking me questions and stuff. So 
long story short, I go, they finally shipped me to one hospital, shipped me to another hospital down in, uh, Southern, in Southern California in San Diego to a, uh, I forget what it was, but they had lost one of my t-shirts, okay? They lost, and it had skulls on it, said, probably said Sturges or some other bike rally. And to replace it, they gave me this shirt. It says, Faith in the Middle. And on the back, it says, Fear is a Liar. Okay. And not long after I received this shirt, stuff starts moving. Stuff starts going. They were telling me I was going to be in that state probably for the rest of my life. On the ventilator, breathing. They, they thought for sure I was going to remain on the ventilator for the rest of my life. But God had other plans. God had other plans. And so I start remembering the things that he told me, like we also rejoice in our suffering because our suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. That we are to count it great joy when we face various trials because the testing of our faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work that you may be patient and complete, lacking nothing. I stand here today when I... Uh, it's sad for me that Jaime left because he was, he's known me the entire time. When I first showed up at Centerpoint, I was on a walker. I was on, a, I was on the oxygen. I was ho in horrible shape. So I go to this Bible study one day. And because like bro uh, Brother Bo said, I go to Centerpoint down here. Amazing church. The leader of the group looks at the shirt, said, you got that from Centerpoint. I said, excuse me? No, I received this when I was paralyzed in the hospital. She goes, okay, but that came from a mission uh, uh, or a, a thing from Centerpoint Church. God had called me there. I'd venture to say, when he opened up my ears when I was young. And when John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he was the Messiah, he said, and Jesus told them to say uh, and tell John that the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk, the the prisoner has been set free and the dead have been risen. God has performed all five of those miracles on me. He does not and will not leave any one of us behind. Not a single one of us. Because I did not deserve any of that. Any of that. But he redeems us. And don't ever think that he, that you're not qualified to do this because he does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Amen. Amen. That's what I got. Amen. Can I pray us out real quick? Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every man that is standing here today. I thank you for the families in which they represent. I thank you for the hedge of protection you have placed around them, Lord, because they are going to be doing a spiritual warfare with everywhere they go. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, for the lives that they touch. 
that they remind them that nobody is going to be left behind. We thank you, Lord, for the eyes that get opened through the ministries they serve in and the words that they say. In everything we do, Lord, let us praise you. Let us praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.